Um, so first of all, I would like to make two sort of disclaimers. Um, the first one is I was invited to give this talk yesterday afternoon. <laughs> so I had literally like less than 24 hours to prepare it. Um, so, sorry. The second one is, um, this includes almost no data. I think there's literally one data visualization that I will include, and I will not talk a lot about data. Um, because this is something that is sort of happening in parallel to the CSV Conf. Um, and it's an initiative that I really love, and <laughs> I just really wanted to talk, um, talk about it. So, I am the CEO of a very small NGO called Lectures Without Borders. Um, our aim is to connect scientists and schools around the world. Um, so, I guess we all agree that science, technology, engineering and mathematics, uh, the education of this um, in school from a very young age is important for kids. Um, but I guess we also all agree that there's high inequalities on the level and the um, quality of the STEM education that people can get depending on their gender, depending on their socioeconomic background, depending on their geographic location. Um, at the same time, <coughs> we know that teachers are making huge efforts in trying to make STEM subjects uh, interesting for kids, using project-based learning, um, using the materials that they have access to, and at the same time, academic institutions are trying to make STEM more um, to basically make it more approachable for kids by organizing things like Science is Wonderful Festival or things that are aimed specifically for kids and adolescents. Um, the problem with these things is they are not as accessible as we would like them to be. Um, on the one hand, academic institutions themselves have um, limited resources for organizing these things um, in terms of even having a physical space, having the money to set up a whole festival for kids. Um, it's really not easy. Also time constraints for both um, the academic institutions, the schools that maybe cannot block a full day for the kids to attend one of these things. And at the same time, <coughs> for many schools, even if they had the time, um, these things happen very far away from what they are. I grew up in a place that doesn't have um, academic institutions because it's a small town. And if I had to attend any of these things, we had to block two full days. First, we needed to go somewhere. We needed to sleep there. This is something that only very rich schools could do. So it's a bit like there's still a lot of barriers to it. So this also perpetuates inequalities, not only in access to STEM education, um, but also like in general, the possibility of kids to eventually consider becoming scientists. So Lectures Without Borders, which we abbreviate LEVIVO, um, will um, try to at least contribute a little bit in trying to solve, uh, to lower these barriers. Our equation is pretty simple. Whenever a scientist is traveling somewhere to attend the conference, to visit their family, whatever they're doing, um, they tell us where they're going. We find a school in their destination that is willing to host them for a lecture, and we coordinate um, a lecture that happens during the school day. The Initiative started in 2017 with four friends um, that were, three of them were scientists, one was a school teacher, and when two of them, one was traveling to Nepal, another one was trying to Indonesia, both of, both of them said it would be really cool if we could go to a school there. They started to reach out to their friends and family and ha happened to find a school in Indonesia and a school in Nepal. Um, and this network started growing from there, basically. Today, um, after, well, I don't know how many years, uh, we are over 400 scientists. We have over 1,000 schools, and we are covering, we're present in 54 countries. Um, <clears throat> since 2020, because of the pandemic, uh, we also started offering webinars whenever scientists are not traveling and or schools cannot host them in person. Um, and these webinars have allowed us to reach, well, especially during the pandemic, thousands of schools. Um, a lot of scientists also started reaching um, out and interested in participating in webinars and even beyond the pandemic because maybe they are not actually traveling, which is perfectly fair, like not everyone travels. Um, and so we kept doing these things um, even after uh, COVID. So this is what I promise, one <laughs> graph. Um, uh, of how our, the number of our lectures grew over time. 
not only the number of lectures grew, but also because of the webinars, the reach of our lecture grew a lot. So um, now we're organizing around 10 lectures a month. And each lecture stopped being from for like 10, 15 students. And now we had like yesterday uh, a lecture with 170 students. Um, so this is how we've been growing. Um, beyond lectures, we also organized some uh, online activities like open lectures. Um, these ones were big uh, events that then f were followed up with a whole project led by the school and mentored by the scientists. So these ones were um, on climate change and they had like, it ran over three months um, during 2021. And this one is a science congress that was held online. It was a planetary science congress for the Europlanet Science Congress um, that is, was run in 2020 and in 2021 fully online. And what we did was we opened the conference to schools by making the talks available, of course, with the permission of the scientists, um, to the students and also allowing them to have a Q&A with the scientists um, and a sort of parallel talk. That's why this uh, has this um, little blue arrow that shows that the there were parallel talks that were on the same topic but specifically targeted for kids and trying to show them a bit why scientists um, go to conferences, what's the aim of it, why science communication is important, and what are the differences between doing an outreach talk and a scientific talk. Um, however, and even though online activities are really cool, um, there's a lot of the in-person interaction that is very important also for the kids to feel close to um, the scientists, to use them as role models, to have a bit of um, more this wonder of science. Um, so in 2022, with the Europlanet Science Congress, what it, we did was combining both things. Uh, we did uh, in-person activities in school in Granada because the event was held in Granada in 2022. And then we also moved this online for all the schools that were not in Granada. Um, and this is how I'm here because based on this experience, um, we thought of doing the same with the CSV Conf. Um, since Basin was um, attending this conference and he's my partner, so I was also coming, um, we thought maybe we could offer this to CSV, and of course I said yes. So we organized uh, seven in person lectures. Four of them happened yesterday. There's uh, two happening on Friday, and one that is actually happening next week. Um, and the idea is we are going to local schools to interest the kids in data science. If you want to talk to the people that gave them yesterday, Bastian is one. Uh, but also, um, there's uh, Josune that is right now giving another talk, um, who gave this talk, which was amazing. She even showed me a visualization of asking the kids if they were interested in data science before and after the talk and seeing the difference um, of why kids were not interested in data science. And they were saying things like, all I've heard about data science is bad things. Like, you know, they collect data about you to then sell you advertisements or whatever. And precisely our idea with bringing the people, the, the speakers of CSV to the schools was to show kids good use of data and examples of what cool things one can do with it. Um, I gave this talk because I needed to cover for someone that at the last minute canceled. And this is something that we luckily don't have uh, very often. But um, the problem is the school already blocked an hour and a half of their day. And now we need to bring someone. So I did give this talk and I talked um, of like examples of all of you and like talking about the talks that were from the CSV. And the questions were all like, I had no idea that uh, you could use data for this. Like how is because you know I'm studying social sciences, I have no knowledge of computers, why would data science be relevant for me? And so this is what we want to do. And ideally I would like afterwards to also organize um, <coughs> sort of follow up activities with the same schools so that it doesn't stop in just one lecture. If you would like to join, we actually have an opening for Friday. <laughs> um, we have, um, what we're doing is not actually a lecture is a um, speed meeting in which I would like to come, I would come also in person um, 
for now there's three scientists. Initially there were five, but due to visa problems, we are not three. Um, and there's uh, the idea is the kids are going to have a short 20 minute slots in which the scientists will only have to very briefly say in five minutes what they're working on and then give the students time for questions and then the groups are going to change. So we can bring as many scientists as we want. So whoever wants to join on Friday, it will be on Friday morning. Anyhow, um, I will just briefly um, tell you a bit more about our website. So in Lectures Without Borders, I've been working <laughs> with my very limited knowledge of programming. I, I did a little website. Um, and what we're trying to do with this is creating a platform for schools and scientists to actually interact. Because so far, we have the problem that everything sort of goes through the core team. So all communications depend on us. And the idea is that we want both scientists to learn from teachers um, on how to like communicate uh, these things to young audiences, and teachers also to learn from scientists. Like It could be refining their classes. Uh, if they want to teach something, they have someone that they can talk to and double check the facts before uh, talking to the kids. Um, also, we have a lot of information now on our website that before we were send sending um, to the school directly or to the scientists directly. Now you can see our code of conduct, you can see the child, uh, child safeguarding policies and all our guides um, and like the guidelines for lecturers and for schools. And um, our idea is that all these things that were before happening um, organized sort of outside the website now will be also published when we organize workshops for scientists to maybe give tips to other scientists on how to present on a specific topic, create communities of interest, give the feedbacks, and all those things that we do. Um, do them sort of um, in a more open way. All of our lectures that are recorded, which are not all of them, all the online ones are, um, but the in-person ones sometimes depend on the school, um, are all available on our uh, YouTube channel. And if you want to know more, you can go right now to our website, or text me, or register, or just, I don't know, talk to me right now. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. This is amazing. Thanks. Uh, we have time for questions. Does anyone have a question? I just wanted to go to the I just want a quick statement. This is a great talk regardless, but 24 hours, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I agree. <laughs> but I, I, I have a, only one question. If, if I understood correctly, so when, when scientists go to one place, they tell you they are going there, so you try to reach the community of that uh, destination and a school? Yeah. I, I was wondering uh, whether, uh, I'm sure you have a, an answer for this, but whether that could provide like a bias or wrong impression to that community that if you want to pursue a career in science, you have to go abroad, like the country where this scientist is coming from? Yes. Um, and actually, that is a very good point that I forgot to mention. Um, that is one thing that I'm actively encouraging people to do is to give lectures in their own country. Um, so we have one, the, the talk that is happening next week is actually uh, by Laura Asion who is from Buenos Aires and is giving a talk in Buenos Aires. Um, and so there's two things that I try to always ask scientists. The first one is, when I say going on holidays, is like I gave talks in my own hometown um, because I want to tell people that you can do it. And still, this sort of paradigm was the, the initial equation of Lectures Without Borders. And it's something that I started. So I joined Lectures for Borders afterwards. I, I joined in 2020. And since I joined, I always ask people if they want to give a lecture in their own hometown, if they know anyone, bring more schools. Also because um, I found myself, especially when I went myself to my own um, school, that a lot of people are like, oh, so like, do you know other people that also went to France to do a PhD? 
And I'm like, no, but I know people that are doing PhDs here that are equally good. <laughs> um, especially, so I'm a virologist. I did a PhD in virology. Um, and it happened to me with a, a radio from my hometown that during the COVID pandemic um, wanted someone to talk about that. And I said, I can give you a very, very good virologist that is also from my hometown, but is working in Argentina. And yeah, but you know, you work in France. And I was like, I worked in vi with viruses, and now I don't anymore. I'm not really the person you want to talk to. You want to talk to someone that is actually researching this, and that's amazing people in Argentina doing this. So it's also like try, I, I agree with you that we need to do this, and one, of my aims for 2023 is to decentralize lectures at borders. Because I find that because of how fast it grew, especially from 2020 until now. Um, so we, when I joined in 2020, there were around 40 people in maybe 35 uh, in our database, like scientists. And we had something like 100 schools. Um, so all this growth was very, very fast, and we have almost no funding, so we are doing it like all of it as volunteers whenever we can. Um, and I find that if we don't start decentralizing things, first of all, it can't grow anymore, but also it will literally just collapse. Um, right now, I am overwhelmed with things, and I am almost 100% of the NGO right now. Uh, because everyone else is working just like one hour, two hours, whatever. Um, and that means that, so what I would like to do is um, basically have hubs in different countries. Uh, basically just maybe one coordinator per country or two, whoever can volunteer a couple of hours, like whenever somebody's going to that country or wants to organize something or a school in that country, because for the webinars, for example, it's usually the schools that request the webinar on a topic. And if a school from a certain place um, requests something, we can contact the people from that country. So actually, it happened recently, a school from Nigeria asked for webinars um, on data science. And I contacted Jason there, <laughs> and, I, and I told him, um, well, Bastian contacted Jason, actually. Um, and we asked if they, if they wanted to give something and because of the Open Bioinformatics Foundation. And they said, actually, we can put you in contact with the Nigeria Hub. And the scientists came in person. And for the um, kids, it was much better to see a person from Nigeria that does bioinformatics than having a white European giving a talk about bioinformatics. So, that is actually where my idea of having the local hubs started. I was like, this is actually much more valuable. And yeah, I'm trying to find a way. If you have ideas, <laughs> um, also if you have ideas for funding, this would be amazing. <laughs> because um, a lot of the things, like we have this huge project that we are now piloting here uh, in a school in Rosario um, that is uh, competition for women in STEM. We want to challenge kids to identify one woman in their community um, that is working in any STEM subject, um, interview them, and then prepare a little video, and then have like a competition on how, like the video should be telling us what this person is doing. Um, so the kids have a bit of science communication and a bit of like interviewing someone else and also gives visibility to the women that are working in their own community and has, has them as role models. And it's a project that one day we would like to do in like a global scale, but we needed to start with one school <laughs> because there's no way we can scale this without piloting it first. And then we will need to find money for it. So like this, we are trying to do small things. But yeah, whatever um, idea you have on how to decentralize this, um, trying. I have a question, Go. which is maybe unfair based off what you just said about how you're already at max capacity. But you mentioned that you wanted a way to like follow up with the schools that you've talked to. Could you tell us more about that? Yes. Um, 
So there's several ideas that we have. Um, and we've been discussing this like the week before Easter. Um, because now we have like a board of members um, that we're creating that are like the members that are m the most engaged started like trying to help us precisely uh, decentralize this. Um, and one of the things that we came up with was a system by which like at the end of each lecture, the scientists could give an idea of like a small project that the, that the teacher could do and basically co-create it with the teacher, like see how feasible it is. Um, if I ask, for example, I don't know, I have a, I'm a virologist and I want the kids to, I don't know, design something that they can do to identify something about viruses. And then like try to do like a follow-up uh, via email with the teacher to give them these instructions to the kids. And then the, the scientists would come once more, something like two or three weeks after their initial intervention, virtually to just mentor how this project is doing or maybe allow the kids to present the results to the scientists or something like this in which there's at least one small follow-up so that it doesn't end in I came, I said something and then you forget about it tomorrow. Um, teachers, it was actually the idea came from a teacher because there's uh, in the board members, um, there's scientists and there's also teachers. So it was we're trying to see how to do it. Mm -hmm. I love this so much. Let's get you funding.